do you trust the system that we've got? I'm not saying do you trust every decision our government experts make, but do you have faith that that system is considering everything and doing its best to make the best decisions? I actually do. I think um, Brendan Murphy is relying on advice from some of our best experts in the country who are looking at... We have the the luxury, of course, of seeing what other countries have done, Um, but we also are in the position where we... There's a lot of unknown still about the virus and sometimes decisions have to be made to prevent um, infections happening. And so a bold decision sometimes needs to be made in the absence of evidence. You started talking about that at the very beginning. Um, I think um, our our leadership, uh, our Chief Medical Officer, a medical officer and others are receiving very expert advice. The decisions are weighing up um, the effects of doing these things and the impact on the whole on our whole country. You know, economic, social impact, for example. But at the same time, wanting to have an intervention now that will prevent us getting an really dramatic increase in infections, which is the last thing that we want or can cope with. Brett Sutton, who's the chief doctor advising the Victorian government and uh, one of the clearer communicators, clearest even, he said this today, it's important to recognise the exponential increase we've seen in cases in Australia has largely been driven by people who have travelled here internationally. Um, Government's chief health officers saying today still very little transmission in community, uh, as in person to person here, that the numbers are driven by international travellers. Do you agree? Is that info solid? Um, That info is solid and it's very important because what we have done in the last few days is completely clamp down on the likelihood of people returning from overseas transmitting by the recommendation that anyone that's come back from overseas needs to go into quarantine, um, self-quarantine for 14 days, which we weren't doing until just last week. So that is a really effective intervention given what we're seeing in our new diagnoses, most of them coming from um, so uh, other countries. That means that what we're good. doing is working and we're isolating those who test positive. Yep, that's it. That is good. What we're most okay. worried about is community transmission where okay. there is no link to overseas travel or so another can I, case. Can I ask two community transmission questions? I do want to get to the schools, but there are no end of stories of people who've come back from overseas. They're turning up uh, at the nurse at a hospital within, day, within hours of arriving. They're chatting happily to the taxi driver, popping out to the supermarket before they quote unquote self isolate. How leaky do you think the international traveller 14-day system is? And I guess I'm asking how much I should worry about it. Yeah, I can't comment on that. Um, We don't have a system of surveillance of our travellers and checking they're in their homes. Other countries have been a bit more invasive on understanding what people are doing in self-quarantine. We don't have a system like that in Australia. We rely on education trust and empowering the community and um, that we're all in it together and um, so that's people what we're understanding. Relying. We're relying on goodwill, aren't we? I we mean, are I know it's indeed. illegal, but we're relying on goodwill. We are, okay. yeah. Teachers, schools, kids, um, people have said to me publicly, privately, those in government making these decisions, the evidence is mixed, on balance, it's the right decision. Um, what would you say to a teacher? because there are so many of them who are concerned about this. I think there's no right or wrong here. Um, If you were going to eliminate any possible risk of any transmission um, in the community, you'd stop all all interactions. Um, We're not going to go down that route of stopping all activity. So then you need to look at the relative risk um, in and, 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 and... Um, benefit of closing down schools. And I'm not an expert in this area, but I understand that um, there have been successful responses without closing schools and then also examples where people have closed schools. I will just talk about what happens to kids when they get coronavirus. We know from the Chinese experience that very few children, um, less than 2.5% of China's 45,000 diagnoses were under the age of nine. 
Uh, what we don't know is uh, why um, and whether that's because kids aren't infected, whether that's because kids clear the infection very well or whether that's because kids can carry the virus and have no symptoms. We certainly know the kids can carry the virus, that's been shown. We just don't know how common that is. Professor Sharon Lewin is with us. She's the director of the Doherty Institute. Um, do we need a lot more test kits, Sharon? Because I know there are 100,000 or close to 100,000 on the way. I saw that with the health minister today. Really rough numbers, 250 million people, 100,000 test kits. That means we've got enough for maybe one in every 250 people. Is that enough? Testing um, extensively is a really good strategy because then you know who's infected and who needs to be isolated and which contacts to follow. Um, at the moment, exactly as you were just saying, most of the people that are coming up positive have had a history of travel. And so we're focusing our testing on people that have the highest risk of being positive. Testing people who have come home, back from international travel and have sim in the last two weeks and have symptoms, or people who have had exposure to someone with COVID-19 and have symptoms, or people with severe yes. pneumonia in hospital. And um, so we have to keep um, up with um, having sufficient tests for those people. If we really broaden testing and we start testing widely in the community for anyone that's got a cough or cold or anyone that's worried about COVID-19, a hit rate of a positive, it's going to become very, very low. And that's why the current recommendations is to use our resources where we're going to get the greatest impact and find the most people with COVID-19. Now, there will be stories of people that have been diagnosed with the virus who haven't had travel or who haven't had known exposure. Um, there are, but those, are, those, num those people are actually very infrequent. Uh, quick question before I get to the traffic. Is it safe to get pregnant this year? The um, information we have so far from, largely from China, where they've had the most cases, 80,000 of now the total of 200,000 cases globally, are that there doesn't appear to be any adverse effects of COVID-19 during pregnancy. Um, that's what we know so far, as opposed to influenza, for example, where we know that influenza can cause much more severe disease in pregnant women. There's no indication at the moment that COVID-19 um, causes worse disease in people who are pregnant. Do you expect, Professor, a cranking up of social control? Do you expect them to say, no cafes, no restaurants, don't leave your house, that sort of stuff? Do you expect that to happen? I'm expecting that we will see greater um, recommendations around social distancing. I'm not sure we're going to go, I hope we won't be going into what's happening in Europe currently, which is a lockdown of, um, of every sort of, of all flights, etc. I'm not sure we're going to see that here because we have been testing and prepared for this for a while, but I expect we're going to see more social distancing measures. We need planes to deliver masks and PPE, don't we? We can't shut down all planes. Exactly. Yeah. That would be a bad outcome. Really appreciate your time. Um, you're doing fantastic work. So thanks so much for giving us some of your valuable time. Pleasure. Thanks very much. Professor Sharon Lewin, she's the director of the Doherty Institute. We are lucky we've got incredible research being done.